All right, everyone, I'm showing 705. Uh, Vic, can you give me a wave that you hear me okay right now? Awesome, wonderful. Uh, hi, everyone, my name is uh, Garrett Arnold. I'm the event manager here at the Mountaineers. Uh, first off, I wanna thank you for joining us at this virtual event and in this virtual space this evening. It's certainly been an interesting event season and I really hope you're all doing well uh, during these difficult times. Um, that said, the Mountaineers and the outdoor community has continued to adapt to a uh, changing event and outdoor recreation landscape. Uh, although our group sizes have been a little bit smaller, we're hosting virtual events such as this uh, and our community of outdoor enthusiasts continue to enjoy uh, the outdoors in the original version of social distancing, getting outside and enjoying nature. Uh, in addition to enjoying this event tonight with Vic, we also have uh, quite a bit of events we're hosting this fall. I'll tell you a little bit about them. You might have seen in the slides here, uh, Conrad Anchor, uh, Mountaineering in the Climate Crisis. That's gonna be Thursday, September 24th. Uh, so Conrad, uh, during his 30 years as a professional climber, uh, he's completed numerous first ascents, uh, including uh, infamous shark fin on Maru, you may have seen his film. Uh, he set speed records on big mountains around the globe and scaled many of the tallest and most technical peaks on the planet. In between expeditions and explorations, he's busy paving the way for outdoor enthusiasts to participate in a different kind of adventure, environmental activism. Uh, so Conrad's going to come and join us, and he's going to shine light on some of his favorite natural landscapes and adventures uh, that afforded him. Uh, but he also will talk candidly about the changes he's seen in our wild places uh, due to the negative impacts of the global climate crisis and offer suggestions on how outdoor-minded individuals and organizations can really help make a difference uh, and protect these wild places that we continue to love. Um, so that's on September 24th. Uh, then after that, we have the virtual Mountain Film Festival. Uh, so you, so, some of you know that we host the Mountain Film Festival uh, here at the Seattle Program Center. This will be our seventh year, uh, but we're gonna do a virtual event. Uh, and we did a, as we've done in years past, a custom playlist, especially for the Mountaineers community. So we go through basically, I'd say four or five hours of films uh, and narrow that down into about a 90 minute playlist that we think really speaks to our community and our interests uh, for that playlist. So that starts on October 3rd, or excuse me, October 1st, but then you have 48 hours to watch that virtual film festival. Uh, so you can watch it Thursday night or Friday night or get up kind of early and uh, finish it on Saturday morning. Uh, and then the last event we have is on October 13th. That's Link SAR's first event ascent. Uh, that's the evening with Steve Swinson. So 18 years after his first attempt to reach the summit of Link SAR, Steve Swinson, legendary alpinist, Mountaineers uh, board director and Mountaineers book author, finally stood atop the notorious technical peak in Pakistan's Karkaram. He was joined by alpinist Mark Ritchie, expedition, expedition leader Graham Zimmerman, Chris Wright, and the first ascent was groundbreaking. So we invite you to join us on October 13th uh, to hear Steve talk about his incredible journey uh, climbing Link SAR. Lastly, I just want to thank our sponsors, uh, Adidas Terex, Carter Subaru, Filson, Mir, Ombras, SMC, Grail, Two Years, Seattle Cider, Ghostfish Brewery, and Georgetown Brewery. Uh, they have been super supportive uh, to the Be Wild uh, series, as well as during these times with events, uh, we continue that relationship and supporting our local businesses and outdoor retailers. Uh, so I'm gonna stop talking now, and now I'd love to hand it over uh, to Vic to enjoy the, and the rest of the show in the evening. Vic, take it away. Unmute. All right, can you hear me, Garrett? All right, good. Well, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I wish we could all be in person because there's a lot more energy when I'm speaking to a group of people and I can hear questions and things like that live as we go. But uh, tonight, I think Garrett's going to be monitoring the chat and uh, you can drop questions in the chat and we'll hit those at the end uh, in particular. But if you have a question, just feel free to drop it in the chat as we go. Um, Another thing, tonight I'm not going to be able to go super deep into any one of these seven summits because I've given talks before on people who are interested in like, what does it take to go climb Denali? 
or Everest, and that's an hour plus talk on its own. So tonight I'm just gonna cover some like fun stories from the times that I've had in the mountains and some of the lessons I've learned and things like that as, as I went through them. If you're interested in learning more about the individual uh, peaks and the, the, the quest of climbing the seven summits, I would recommend this mountaineer's book called uh, Climbing the Seven Summits. It's, my screen's cutting it out a little bit there, but by uh, Mike Hamill. And uh, it's a, it wasn't available when I was climbing it, so I had to kind of compile things together on my own, but Mike does a great job laying out the, the details of all the different climbs that are out there and the different routes and considerations, suggested order, all that kind of thing. Um, so take a look at that book. It's available on uh, the Mountaineers website. And if you're interested in seeing videos of the climbs from Everest to Choyoyu that we'll cover today, you can go to my YouTube channel uh, here on the page and I'll have that up at the end as well. So with that, let me get into it a bit here. Um, you know, these days I'm not climbing big Himalayan peaks, but I'm out skiing, I love doing, rock climbing here in Washington state or elsewhere, ice climbing up in Canada on occasion when we can travel, trail running is my latest thing, and my real latest, latest thing is family camping. So my outdoor adventure spans the whole gamut, but uh, today we're going to go back to Seven Summits, and I'm going to take you along this quest and how did I get into it, and uh, Tell you a little bit about my time doing that. So you may wonder, uh, did I have parents who were alpinists or big into the outdoors like this? And the answer is no. I grew up in Michigan, which is known for its extreme mountains made from earth movers. And so in the left here, you see the ski area, Caberfe Peaks, built in the 30s with the CCC, and then the hills were later expanded with uh, earth movers like that to get to 500 vertical feet. And my family did go outdoors a lot. We got into skiing and biking. And uh, my, my father's kind of advice was, you always wanna be able to say yes. So you don't have to be awesome at any of those activities like skiing or tennis or whatever it is, but you should know how to do it and be able to accept an invitation if someone gave you the invitation. So I, I took that up and took on a lot of different things. And when you did do something, you gave it your all. And so when I jumped into climbing, I started giving it my all. And I got into climbing in 2000, alpine climbing in 2002. I came out to Seattle and did a summer six day class on Mount Baker with Alpine Ascents. And here I learned all the basics of snow camping, route finding, anchors, rope travel, crevasse rescue. I had a great time. And at that point, I kind of knew that this was something that I wanted to do. I came back out in 2004. Uh, when I was doing a graduate internship in the Seattle area and climbed Mount Rainier twice. You can see based on the vintage of my gear there, a Petzl Zoom headlamp, which used those giant flat batteries, which you used one per climb for like 10 bucks, and then a pair of plastic double boots. So you kind of know the vintage there of, of the gear. In 2004 then, I was in grad school and I wasn't yet thinking about the seven summits exactly, but I was enjoying mountaineering and I thought there was a group from business school that was interested in climbing Kilimanjaro. And I thought that sounded interesting. And so we went to Kilimanjaro and here we are, that's me in the, uh, the white shirt in the middle there, um, right here. And we took the Umbwe route and it's you know really a glorified hike, I would say, but it's a pretty amazing cultural experience. and seeing the country, um, being up into high elevation, and I had a great trip. I felt great on summit day, and so I started thinking about, that's me in the orange coat uh, right here with the same Petzl Zoom headlamp again, uh, thinking about, you know, could I go higher? Um, what would be interesting to do for a next type of event? And so coming when you're graduating from school in the May, June timeframe, the next best thing to do when you have such a nice break between school and work and not needing to use vacation is to go climb Denali naturally. And um, so before I did that though, like I wanna tell you a little story about Kilimanjaro and what did I learn? So first is that, you know, altitude is really no joke. Um, on day three or day four of our trip here, one of our members started complaining of headaches and she dismissed them as being, well, I regularly get headaches, and so it's just the regular headaches that I get. And one of the things that I had always you know, learned to assume is that you have to assume it's altitude until you can definitively prove it otherwise. Because 
can quickly result in a very serious condition. Um, so it was a good learning to go through and understand kind of the altitude physiology and uh, experience that through someone else's discomfort, I would say in this case. Um, you know, there she is on the, on the summit. So she made the summit. She needed significant help on the way back down. Um, but thankfully there was resources in the team through the, um, the, the two assistants there who could help her back down the mountain in that case, because uh, as you know, Ed Beasters is most famous for saying, getting up is optional and, and getting down is mandatory. So after my Kilimanjaro experience, um, I ended up going to Denali. And this is another one where I learned, a, I luckily learned a lesson, but um, it was mainly through good luck, I would say. So in 2005, in June, I headed to Denali. And we plan on climbing the, the West Buttress. And it's typically a two to four week expedition, depending on the weather. And I didn't really go want to go with a commercial trip. I wanted to go on my own with some friends. Unfortunately, finding the right people to go with can be challenging. And so I had, I landed in Anchorage and sat down at the baggage terminal. And I had, I had only met one of these two guys once before for a dinner. The other guy I had talked to on the phone a few times. And now we were going on a really big mountain expedition together for what could be 30 days. They came into the baggage terminal having arrived early, earlier and looked for the only, you know, Indian looking guy with some climbing duffels and said, hey, are you Vic? And with that, we were off on our trip. So it was a huge risk. I, I highly don't recommend that approach for climbing, finding climbing partners uh, to anyone. And one of the most important things is that someone who's not nice at sea level doesn't get better at 17,000 feet when they're stuck in a tent with you for three days because of a snowstorm. Um, so it's really important to shake out your climbing partners in addition to your kit before you head out into these environments. Thankfully, um, these guys are both great and uh, they weren't axe murderers. Uh, they're funny, easy to get along with. We were all roughly the same height. And for those non-climbers, you might think, what does same height have to do with anything? Well, same height equals same size steps. And which in climbing can make a huge difference in terms of efficient travel. It also meant the same size clothes, so if we ever needed to share anything, we could. Um, so in this photo, Justin is demonstrating our, our newly constructed outhouse. And at the time, that was where you would uh, bag your human waste and then toss it into a deep crevasse outside of camp. I'm not up to date with what the latest practice is. I believe it's carry everything off the mountain um, nowadays for Denali, of, of solid waste, that is. And here we are goofing around uh, with an impromptu dance party on the left after caching a load at the 14 camp. And Justin, you know, showing off his attempt at claiming the title of, of King P by nearly topping out on an algae bottle. Uh, and as you know, on a big expedition or when it's really, really cold in your tent, it's far better to use an algae at night or in bad weather than it is to go outside. So we had a beautiful day on summit day. We ended up summiting on day 12 and they unfurled this banner here, which said seven summits cancer climb. My teammate uh, in the red coat here, Martin, was a three-time cancer survivor and he was keen on and I should say is keen on summiting the seven summits. And so they put out the list and said, was I in? Uh, was I up for the challenge? And after getting to this point with these guys and having such a great experience, and it really had a fantastic trip, I said, it was easy to say yes. And I already had one of the seven done previously. We were on top of number two. And so now I had not only the list of where to go, but I had the right folks for the journey. And we continue to climb to get to, together today. In fact, Martin officiated my and my wife's wedding um, back in 2012. Now, Denali also gave me a taste of how anticipating um, problems and planning for them can save your bacon. So descending from the 17-2 high camp on Denali, we had weathered a storm at the 17-2 camp where we were stuck in our tent for three days because of high winds and snow. And that was after our, uh, uh, after summiting. And as soon as it cleared and the snow kind of stabilized, we booked out of there and we came down from high camp past, you know, advanced camp at 14 and picked up stuff at every camp we had left all the way back. And we came back all the way to base camp. And so you can see us hauling a big load here. And at one point we ran into an area called the Valley of Lost Wands. 
and those are the wands that you use to mark your trail. And it's named that because fog often settles in that area. As you can see in the photo here, there is no visibility. The person in the front can't tell whether they're seeing 10 feet or 100 feet. And so as a result, climbers are known to have placed lots of bamboo wands as they wander around in the valley. Thankfully, we had read about this in advance, had tracked our path on the little wrist battery GPS that I had at the time. And uh, so on the way back down, we just pulled out the GPS and backtracked and we were back to base camp in no time at all. So it's one of those that I learned very early on, like anticipating those problems that you can have, planning for them, and then being able to pull those tools out of your toolkit, super helpful and super safe. And as a result, we made it back to base camp and to the Glenlivet, and which when you're dehydrated and at altitude can pack quite a punch. And I think my, my two teammates almost weren't allowed on the plane back to Talkeetna um, as a result of, of finishing that Glenlivet at base camp. We all did well on Denali and we looked at going higher and looking at the next one of our seven summits. So in kind of over the Christmas holiday slash January 2008, we went to Aconcagua, which at 22,800 feet or so is the tallest mountain outside of Asia. We traveled there um, in January 2008, as I said, and this was going to be my first international trip without guides and without a support structure. And so I went and earned my wilderness first responder certification so I'd be better equipped to deal with medical emergencies on the trip. Thankfully, I didn't need to put that to use during this trip, but I have had to respond to uh, many incidents since then and happy to, to share some of those in the Q&A at the end if people are interested in that type of stuff. So the hike into base camp is about 25 miles and we did it over three days, partly to acclimatize to the elevation. Uh, and partly because 25 miles is a decent distance to cover and you can see our pile of gear here in the top left photo. The, we packed all of our sharps, harnesses, ropes, fuel, and all that other miscellaneous stuff in a rigid blue barrel to keep those things safe and out of our duffel bags. And it was strapped onto a mule. Um, it may not have been this exact mule, but it was a mule like this one. Well, that mule carrying our barrel somehow got spooked on one of the steeper parts of the trail and reared back up and lost its footing and tumbled off a cliff. And at first we were really worried that, um, you know, obviously we're worried about the mule. Um, then we're worried about our gear and can they even get down to where the mule is, where our gear is, because that was all of our critical climbing gear for, uh, you know, even fuel for, um, for cooking and for making water and everything like that. It turns out they were able to get down to our gear. The, the mule didn't survive. Uh, they had to finish it off. The, a fuel bottle inside there ruptured and soaked all of our gear in that bucket or in that barrel with fuel. And so we opted to continue the climb with kind of saturated gear that may be of questionable integrity, um, but we retired all that gear when we got home. And here we are uh, mourning that loss and disposing of the fuel that was inside the barrel through a, a rapid burn um, so that it, it wouldn't get into the ground too much. Uh, we did a technical route on uh, Aconcagua called the Polish Direct, which sees less than probably a few percent of the climbers tackle it. And a lot of those who do intend to tackle it don't end up tackling it. They end up doing what's called the Polish Traverse, which approaches the mountain in the same way, but then ends up, um, rather than coming up this snow slope here, it diverts from, from camp, uh, high camp in this area, across over this way around to the back side of the mountain where it's just a walk up the mountain. And the Polish Direct it starts at high camp at 18 and a half thousand feet approximately, ascends about 3,000 feet of steep snow and ice up to 60 degrees in angle. Um, fairly similar to climbing Liberty Ridge in that regard, just starting about uh, 8,000 feet higher than Liberty Ridge and, uh, and then easing off towards the very top. So it was a fantastic, um, we had fantastic conditions, great step kicking conditions in snow, and it climbed it as a team of four. So we added one to the team from Denali, ended up getting to the top very late in the day, as you can see here, as the sun is getting low, and summited again on a, a day 12 of the expedition as the sun dropped really low in the sky. We then had to descend in darkness back to our high camp and uh, into dropping temperatures 
but thankfully, you, you know, you were able to use maps, the follow a boot, well-worn boot pack, and uh, GPS to get back to our campsite. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about making sure you have the right teammates. I would say one of the things that's super important about having a good teammate is that both you and they pack a positive mental attitude. It weighs nothing and it will help you when you have these obscene loads like this as you try and get off the mountain as quickly as possible after you've completed your objective. So here on the, uh, the left two pictures is uh, our teammate Travis, who is, is carrying everything, including the kitchen sink, sink I think there, and also has a, a bag of you know, human waste strapped to the outside of him, carrying it off the mountain, uh, demonstrating his positive mental attitude. And then the picture on the right is Justin, uh, also carrying an extremely heavy load off the mountain. After Aconcagua in August of 2008, we looked at heading to Elbrus. We actually were there during the time that Russia was invading Georgia. And the, the mountain is in Russia. We weren't sure if we were going to be able to go up until about a week before as a column of tanks was proceeding from Russia into Georgia. And luckily, it was the next valley over from where we were was where the highway where the, kind of the invasion action was happening. And so the consulate said, oh, it's fine. You're coming into Russia. You know, Russia was the invading party. So it was relatively safe in that regard. Um, now, Elbrus is a, um, a very interesting mountain. And I think it's one that probably wouldn't get climbed too much other than it being one of the seven summits. And it's a, as you can see, it's a fairly plain uh, cone type of volcano here in this picture. You do get to acclimatize a chairlift. So there's Travis headed up on a single chairlift to a different peak nearby where we could take a chairlift up and then go for a day hike to try and acclimatize a bit to the altitude. Uh, as we got up to start your trip, you take a gondola or a tram up and then a chairlift up and you end up near these barrels huts where some climbers or tourists will stay. And uh, we also have this unique site of tourists coming up wanting to get up onto the snow again in the middle of summer and stripping down into their you know, bikinis and shorts and taking photos with their boyfriends and girlfriends and things like that. So it's a little bit of a, a surreal place to be. At the same time, it was a place that um, really struck home the importance of looking after these mountain places. So here, here's, um, I think, Martin in the background there and me uh, standing around a pile of garbage that clearly had just been left off to the side near one of these huts with no indication that it would ever be taken off the mountain and uh, plenty of debris in the area. Now, now we camped higher than just about any camp on uh, any hut or camp on the mountain. And we're filtering our water from some of the glacial runoff. But uh, this was the first time that I had ever gotten really sick on a mountain. And I think everyone on my team got sick. And we ended up um, becoming intimately familiar with the outhouse, which was close to our um, camp and ha having to deal with a 24 to 48 hour bug that induced vomiting and diarrhea simultaneously, which is incredibly challenging to deal with in a mountain environment, let alone at home. And uh, so aside from Imodium and wet wipes and, and TP and people trying to help each other, it was a, a, a tough go. Thankfully, we had built enough time in our schedule being an independent group like this that we could all get sick we could all get better and we could still climb the mountain. So that was the, the upside of it. But it, again, reinforcing the importance of having a clean environment like this. The contrast to someplace like Denali could not be overstated. Denali was an incredibly clean mountain uh, while we were there. It wasn't climbing. Um, it's not a technical or uh, exposed route if you stick to the, the main route. Uh, we did stick to the main route, but you'll notice in the summit photo there something unusual about one of my teammates. It might be a little hard to see in the picture, but um, Justin in the yellow jacket is here is not wearing crampons, and that's because a pair of crampons of his were stolen from our tent while we camped one night, and so we had brought a rope in case we needed it. We decided, well, if he doesn't have crampons, we should probably rope up in case he goes for a slide, and that way we all stay safe on the mountain. We ended up getting to the summit, uh, getting back down home, had, had a good trip overall, and, and really enjoyed exploring Russia, Moscow, St. Petersburg afterwards as well. That's one of the great parts about going on a quest like this is the ability to just travel the world, 
see it from a unique vantage point from the climbing aspect, but then also see the cultural sites along the way. So I, as you may have guessed, like we come up with a list of you know climbing the seven summits or something like that. Um, you you dream big, right? Uh, but let's be clear, I didn't just go and book my flights for Everest. If I had, I probably wouldn't be speaking to you today. I'd likely be a permanent relic on the mountain like many of those people you read about who aren't prepared and just have the, have the dollars or, or take out a loan and, and go after it. Um, now the goal is also scary and not just the, for the fact that people die or it's expensive no matter how you go. Nobody likes to fail on something like this. So I really wondered if I was worthy and if I was up for this challenge of climbing Everest. And so as an engineer in my in my educational training and now more in business, but I am all about uh, problem solving and breaking down big problems into the components and that you can just size to the right amount and that you can take on. And it's not glamorous or sexy problem solving. It's just hard work and grit. So I studied Everest and what does it take to get there? Who is successful on the mountain? And how can I be more like them? What can I do to put my odds in my favor? And I think in the roughly the 10 years from two or eight years from 2000 to 2008 or so, when I looked at the statistics, the people who were successful on Everest were those that had um, used supplemental oxygen, had prior experience climbing an 8,000 meter peak, so going on a big expedition, and went with an organized group. And knowing what I was doing for my job at the time, I didn't have the time to plan logistics and to get a detailed group together and go on my own and you know arrange a, arrange a base camp and all that kind of stuff. And so I was going to be going with a commercial team. I also, um, you know, I'm not a professional mountain guide or a mountaineer, and uh, I'm certainly not a model. So I uh, I need my brain for my living, and so I wanted to use oxygen to preserve my brain, so I didn't get, have, have permanent brain damage, which they, some people believe occurs from extreme uh, deprivation at these elevations. And so that kind of led me to the path that I was going to take. And so when I looked at what are the reasonable peaks to go do prior to an Everest expedition, that led me to Cho'oyu, which is the sixth tallest peak in the world, so one of the 14 8,000 meter peaks uh, shown here on the screen from our advanced base camp. And the, I'll show you the route. I think you guys can see my cursor, but um, Camp One is about right here on the right sun shade line here. And then the route follows along here, uh, right up through here to the saddle, and then back and around through some of this mess in the middle. And then Camp Two is right in the very center of the photo, um, just above the ice fall area before the large snow slope. And then camp three is just, um, I'd say about like just below the rock ridge um, and above the, the snow rib here in the middle of the face to kind of get you oriented. Now travel in Nepal doesn't always go to plan. So for climbing to Oyo, even though you're, coming, you're climbing from the Tibet side, uh, you typically go from Kathmandu and you then you get into a van or a bus and then you drive out to the Tibet border at the Freedom Bridge in uh, Zhangmu. And then uh, you run into delays like this as you're driving there. And luckily in this case, there was a front end loader that happened to be moving this landslide out of the road and it only took a couple hours, but uh, we had plenty of these. Again, you, you run into logistical delays with permits. So we had a, the wrong color stamp in one of our permits for the expedition. And so we had to spend the night at the border while a courier ran back to get the right color stamp. Um, and this is from an expedition provider who does this every year. So it's kind of just a, one of those things that um, may not be exactly the facts, right? Um, and then once you cross the border, you hop into a series of Land Rovers, your gear goes into a couple big, uh, huge kind of military-ish trucks that follow along and you, you drive in over a series of days um, and you're driving at almost uh, 17,000 feet here. And uh, Shishapangma is in the background there, one of the other 8,000 meter peaks. We had a large commercial team for this. This is at Chinese base camp uh, for Choyu, approximately 16,000 feet. We had 26 uh, clients or members. The trip organizer here is Dan Majeur, um, famous for rec rec uh, rescuing Lincoln Hall on Everest in uh, 2010 maybe I think it is and that's me here off on the left 
uh, as well as some of the Nepali Sherpas who came along, as well as the Tibetan high altitude porters who joined. And with 26 people and all those support staff, you need a lot of stuff. So there's an example of one of the military-ish uh, trucks carrying all the gear. And you can see all of the uh, propane cylinders here off on the left for carrying gear and tons of food and everything. And additionally, you've got all the members gear. Uh, and so here's, you know, duffels per person times 26 people uh, piled up waiting for yaks. This is an interim base camp that we hiked to. And finally, we were off and walking and our yaks were carrying our gear into advanced base camp. And that was great, not having to carry your own gear. Uh, you're still getting used to the altitude, you know, 17,000 plus feet, incredibly tiring. You're walking through an endless moraine like this. And we are on a border region between Tibet and Nepal. And so this is a military control zone uh, on the Tibet side where they have a checkpoint. And we hiked in with just eight packs at this point and the yaks are carrying all of our gear. And it's still relatively slow going. Um, part of it is you're conserving energy. There's no point in going fast. You want to get acclimated. Uh, part of it is because you can't go that fast because you're getting acclimated. And we pass the military checkpoint and they check us off a master permit. There's no visa in your passport that says you're in China, which is a little interesting, having done business travel in China, uh, major travel in China. And we passed through the checkpoint and we wandered into base camp. And this is advanced base camp at about 18 and a half thousand feet. And as we arrived into base camp and crowded into one of the mess tents there, uh, the radio chatter started to increase. And it turns out that our yaks were being detained at the military border because they lacked the correct permit for, or the correct day on their permit. Uh, so we were at base camp with nothing but tents and no sleeping bags, you know, no puffy down suits or anything like that at 18 and a half thousand feet. So we huddled in a base camp tent. Uh, luckily, the crew had come up early and had set up tents and we had food and fuel and things like that. So they made hot drinks and other things. And uh, some other teams that were already there loaned us some foam pads to sit on so we weren't sitting on cold rocks on the tent floor. And the guides finally negotiated with the, uh, the military to let our, our yaks go at 11 p.m. because that was almost midnight and therefore almost the next day, um, which is when the permits were valid. So we celebrated and within an hour our bags started to arrive and I can tell you we slept, slept late the next day. Now a lot of people ask like, what's the difference between a Himalayan expedition like, at, like Choyoyu or Everest and a Dedali? So uh, unlike on, on Himalayan peaks, on Denali, and especially when you go unguided, you are doing all of your own work. So here's a typical photo in the top left from Denali at, I don't even know which camp this would have been at, but it's, it works for any camp you would have been at. Um, you'll see a, you know, half a dozen water bottles queued up for making water. There's a trash bag of snow in the vestibule, um, uh, you know, two fuel canisters and a bottle of fuel there. And you essentially spend a couple hours making water every day and just trying to get hydrated. Now, in contrast, at Choyu, in advanced base camp here at 18 and a half thousand feet. We're in a nice big tent. I think there's probably even a little heater in the back. Um, we have a tablecloth, we have plates, silverware, uh, lots of thermoses with tea and hot water. You have meals served to you on plates. Sometimes you even get, even get a cake or a pizza. And each morning, uh, one of the, the cook boys would come around to each member's tent. And this is again, the budget version and I'll tell you about the different versions when I get to Everest here, but uh, the budget version, and they would still offer you tea in bed, um, even though you're in just like a three-man uh, style tent of your own at base camp. Another difference is when you set up camp. So on Denali in the top left here, this is at high camp at Denali. We knew the storm was gonna blow in the day after we summited. And so we spent the day before summiting building walls that were as tall as my shoulder in the photo and that were more than a foot thick uh, to withstand that kind of storm that can happen on Denali. Now, uh, also in Denali, you're typically just moving up the mountain consistently. You might carry a load up and go back down, and then you move your camp. Then you carry a load up, and then you move back down, and then you move your camp up. Whereas on uh, Cho'oyu or Everest, you are consistently doing rotations on the mountain where you go up for a day or two and then come back down and rest. Then you go up for a day or two and come back down and rest. And really recover in that advanced base camp where you have better, better facilities, and things, and your body can actually recover at that altitude. Now, 
here was the photo at Camp 2 at 22,000 feet. So that's almost 2,000 feet taller than Denali in, in absolute elevation. And we're just walking around. No one's using oxygen or anything like that at this elevation. But you can see the tents are set up in a row. They are lashed down with static climbing rope tied to each other and anchored to dead men anchors in the snow um, made with bamboo so that they don't melt out as the sun hits a, a metal stake or something like that. And rather than building snow walls, because that would just take far too much work and exhaust everyone involved. So it's, it's not the fact that the storms are less severe, uh, because we did have um, more than 80 mile an hour winds on Choyu. We lost 25 tents in Camp 1, uh, where they literally just shredded open. Uh, and you can see that video on YouTube on my um, YouTube channel if you go there. Uh, another one that I'll cover, uh, the last one I'll cover for you is the style of climbing is totally different in the Himalaya. So rather than being roped to each other, here we are on Denali being roped to each other, towing a sled, we're going at the pace that the team can go. Uh, on, on Everest you're, and Choyu and some of these other peaks, you're using fixed lines. And this is Camp 1 at Choyu, so the same as the summit elevation of Denali. This is where we lost all of our tents, were uh, these ones right here behind Smuli. And the route follows, um, follows this kind of ridge boot pack here. You can see a climber here, climbers up through here, more climbers up through here, uh, more climbers right up through here, and then up and around this way, and then Camp 2 is right up in here. And uh, so this is where you're doing rotations, but you're going on fixed lines because each person can move at their own speed and is always secure. And so it's a, it's a very important thing for speed uh, in descending. Plus the route is always clear. Yes, they can get buried in snow, but as soon as you can find one, you can just kind of pull up on the line through the snow and unbury it as you go. I also learned a ton about base camp life and way to be comfortable there. So having a thick mattress in base camp, you know, foot powder so your feet don't stink and get dried out, bio soap for your laundry, um, even town clothes that are skinnier than what you are when you, when you get there because I think on Everest I probably lost 20 pounds. So it's important to be able to accommodate that or have a good belt when you get off the mountain. Also bringing really tasty food rather than sport food. You're going to be there a long time so you want to make sure you have really yummy food to eat. Despite losing our entire Camp 1, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, and those tents, I, we had a very good trip. We didn't get very many rotations in, but thankfully the weather came in when we needed it. I was super strong on summit day, uh, summiting way faster than the rest of the team. Ended up getting up here all by myself, had to wait around for, for another group to come up to take my picture. And then uh, I, I went from the Camp 3 at 7,500 meters to 8,200 meters, and then all the way back down to ABC, in one day, uh, ABC is at 5,800 meters. So that's a, that's a, a gross elevation shift of over 3,000 meters, over 10,000 feet in one day at very high altitude. Uh, and I think I slept like 15 hours then, um, but it was, it was great. And standing on the summit here, uh, this is how you know you get to the true summit on Troy because you can see Everest and, and Lhotse here just off to the side. And so I felt like I was ready at that point. A summit is, is one part of it, right? Getting home isn't always so easy, easy, easy either. And here you can see the road that we had to drive back um, cut into the side of this cliff. And you can imagine what might happen if an earthquake hits a road like this. Well, actually, I can just show you. We had an earthquake while we were there, and a massive rock slide came down and blocked the road. And we got there just um, before the police had really shut it down. And our guide was able to radio ahead and get some vehicles on the other side of this to pick us up, but our bags were all left behind. And so I didn't actually get my gear other than my day pack and what I had left in Kathmandu back until I think two months later in Seattle at a, at a decent expense, sent air freight separately. And you can imagine the funk in that duffel after uh, sitting and marinating for two months after a climbing expedition like this. So if you can remember, I just said I was in, uh, in October 2008, I was on Cho'o um, If anyone remembers what happened in October 2008, that was a global financial crisis. I was a consultant uh, at the time working at McKinsey, and there wasn't a huge amount of consulting demand given the uh, global financial crisis. And so just a few months later, I was able to say, how about some more time off work without pay? And they said, that sounds great. Um, so I ended up just six months after summiting Cho'oyu, going back to Nepal in the spring of 2009 to head to Everest. And I went with the same group, Summit Climb and Dan Majur. 
And in the long way into base camp, you know, everything there needs to get carried by yaks or humans. Nowadays, occasionally people are using helicopters, but back then it was not common to carry loads in with helicopter all the way to base camp. Um, this camp's pretty nice and it gets better each year. Now we were on a budget expedition. We were like the, the budget of the budget. Um, and uh, so we had a nice dining tent, we played board games. We had to hike an hour and a half to get to an internet cafe and be able to you know, send an email or something like that. Nowadays it's a 4G LTE and base camp. Everyone has iPads with you know, everything Netflix downloaded. Uh, people fly in sushi, some have a sauna and a coffee bar. Okay, don't get me started on these five-star expeditions, but uh, this is our shower tent in the bottom right. You I think I took a shower maybe three times on the expedition. You'd have to wait for a really sunny, warm day, and then you get a tiny little garden sprayer here and a little bit of indoor-outdoor carpeting to, uh, to take your shower. This team was much smaller. I think we were nine total on Everest, and uh, the ice fall is really the most dangerous part of the route. There's prayer flags here across the route because you need the prayers to get through safely. Uh, it's incredibly beautiful climbing though. Again, fixed lines the whole way. You can see the climber here attached to the fixed line that shot around this way. You can see it popping back into view up here, a ladder. Again, here's, here's two or three ladders um, roped together on this one. And, you know, there are objective um, hazards. So this is a avalanche that came down off the shoulder of Everest from the same place where much later, one of the uh, big avalanches came down and killed 16 Sherpa, I believe it was, um, in 2014, 15, I forget the year now. But um, this, this did end up killing one person while we were there and um, injuring two others. And it, and it was later in the day than what typically people are in the space, but um, not a totally unreasonable time to be there. And so you, you do try to plan for issues that you can have, but nothing's always in your control in this environment. And that's just something you have to accept when you go into this environment. So as we grew up, we were one of the early teams on the mountain that, on that year, and we were really ahead in our acclimatization schedule, feeling good. We were ready for the summit. I think the ropes were into the summit and a forecast called for a potential weather window. So we moved up to Camp 2 to be ready to take advantage of that. The photo here on the right is from Camp 1. The route to Camp 2 is um, what these people are on here in the right-hand side of the Western Coon. Camp 1, approximately 20,000 feet or so. Um, and at this point, you should be feeling like you're moving your fastest and you're acclimated to the altitude. Uh, here's a photo of me moving through the Western Coon. You can see uh, it's a super crowded time of year on Everest. Um, I always like to discuss the crowds with people because people always say, I thought Everest was so crowded. And it, it is and it isn't. And so it isn't in that, just like this picture, this is a typical day. Where it is crowded is it can be crowded on summit day because everyone tries to go on the same few days when the weather is really good, everyone's schedules have lined up, et cetera. And so that is when you see those famous crowd pictures typically. Anyway, at this point in the expedition, I should have been my fastest. I should have been acclimatized the most. However, I was just dragging my butt. And I fell more than an hour behind my teammates. Um, when I finally arrived into Camp 2, I just collapsed in my tent. Like, uh, I just laid down. I had no energy. Um, the cook at Camp 2 brought me a, a plate of lunch, and I couldn't stomach anything. Um, I just couldn't feel like eating it. Anymore. And all I could think about was taking a rest. And I knew that if the team was headed up, I was, I was headed down. There was something not right. And the optimist in me said I could recover in base camp and try again in a few days to rest or shake this cold or whatever it was. I had a lot of sinus stuff. Well, it turns out that uh, luck was in my favor again and the weather window turned into a snowstorm, which is the right photo. And we had to retreat into the Western Coon in a complete whiteout following the, the route as best we could and getting back to base camp. We ended up staying in base camp for probably like five days, I think. I'd have to go back and look at my journals. But uh, here I hit the tea, vitamins, you know, cold meds, uh, antibiotics, like everything hard to try and get healthy as quick as I could. And uh, thankfully the weather gave me enough time to recover. And so the next time up, I was on my game. I was moving as fast as I could. This is on the load seat face headed up from Camp 2 towards Camp 3. You can see that shine is just the blue ice. And despite having you know, hundreds of people going up and down on this route, uh, there's very little steps you can see kicked in. 
and we arrived into camp three and we had to spend more than an hour and a half peeing our tents out, which would become buried under wind slab. Not the best way to conserve energy on a summit push, but uh, required work. Now this was one of my favorite camps because you're so high up, um, you're at, I don't know what it would be, 23, 24,000 feet, something like that. And you're looking back down on the right here, this area here is camp two. Camp one is right here where the shadow kind of is before it drops down the, the, the Kumbu Icefall into base camp area. This is Pomori here, uh, and then Choyu is out this way further. What a view. This is a little bit more typical of some of the crowd photos you may have seen more recently. This is headed up from Camp 3, um, or looking back down, I should say, toward camp, towards Camp 3 from Camp 4. And this is the South Call Camp right here. And um, you can see the route with a person here, some more people here, uh, coming up right through here, all the way out to the shoulder, which is, this is called the balcony here. Uh, sometimes people will change oxygen cylinders there. Um, following the ridge line then, up to here, this is the south summit that you see. You can't see the true summit when you're going up. And in the photo on the right, you can see in the yellow dots and orange dots, these are the tents from the South Call Camp here. So if you remember into, into thin air when people lost their way, part of it was uh, the fixed lines. They didn't put fixed lines where it's flat here because it's flat. There's not a risk of you really falling or anything here. But the risk they, as they discovered then was that the risk that you don't find the right vector and you don't end up on your path to um, your high camp. So nowadays, at least in 2009, they ran the fixed lines almost into camp itself. They very often had a light on the end of the fixed lines and lights left on some of the tents so that people could see their way in bad conditions. Um, beautiful climbing and beautiful views on a summit day like this. It was maybe negative 40 uh, while we were there, but um, you can see the, the crowds in this view here. We set a new record that day around uh, 90 people attempting the summit. I believe 80 successfully summited with 10 turning around. We had um, you know, good weather and that was partly why you get crowds is because everyone shares the weather forecast and has the same weather forecast and that ends up getting everyone to say, well, back in 1996, it was a, oh, the 15th is a lucky day. We should go on that day. Now it's a, well, the wind speed is and the temperatures and precipitation, et cetera, looks best on the 15th. So all expeditions are going to try and go on the 15th, and that leads to, can lead to a lot of crowding. And uh, this is higher up on the route um, near the Hillary Step. This is, uh, which is the Hillary Step is no longer there because of the earthquake that triggered the massive um, earthquake in Nepal. And this is me in the white backpack right here. So interesting to have that photo taken by, taken by someone else on my team headed up. This guy in the other yellow suit here is actually carrying a statue of Buddha up that he put up on the summit. And, and ended up making it to the top um, on May 19th with my team, had beautiful conditions, spent almost an hour on the summit before coming down and uh, really just a, just a memorable experience. Now, I'm sure you know, many of you have read Into Thin Air and the books about, or the other books by the different participants or have watched the movie um, about people getting lost in the storm and I mentioned that earlier. So one of the things I did learning from Denali, right, was around the Valley of the Lost Wands and there's the GPS again is I absolutely had that GPS on me and tracking my way as I was going up the entire, you know, route and dropping waypoints in such that I could find my way back. Uh, I also carried uh, a radio, as did everyone on my team, to be able to radio other people on the team rather than, you know, just putting it between two people or something like that. I carried my own satellite phone. Uh, I had... Uh, both in injectable and oral uh, steroids like dex dexamethasone to treat altitude illness. And in fact, on the way down from the summit, a teammate and I came across an unconscious climber and in Sherpa, and we were able to help administer uh, IM dexamethasone and revive that climber in, in about 10 minutes. And I ended up reviving, coming to, staggering down uh, with the support of, of two Sherpas, one his own and one from another team and, and surviving. So having those things and knowing how to use those incredibly important in an environment like this. Because if you think about the number of people, people often find safety in the numbers, but uh, when you think about what's the actual mental capacity and the physical capacity that's available to help someone else, it's actually you know single digit percent of your human capacity. So total inability to just pick someone up and throw, throw them over your shoulder and take any steps. Um, probably can't even contemplate that in your head. Now, people often ask, um, 
you know, were there any that I didn't almost make? And so it's a little funny to talk about Kosciuszko in Australia, uh, which is the easiest of the seven summits as being the one I almost didn't make. And it wasn't because we got a traffic ticket or anything like that. After a long drive from Sydney with some of my climbing friends uh, into the snowy mountains of, of Australia here, we debated taking the chairlift or hiking from the base. And I prevailed and said, after you know five hour drive, we should get a longer hike in. And so we started hiking. And the hike started through about waist deep grass. And as I took a step, stepped in a rabbit hole, and I just about broke my, my right ankle. And I heard a, a, a snapping sort of noise. I fell to the ground and um, I knew that that was gonna be some serious pain. And luckily one of my friends had sprained his ankle three weeks prior, had, a, had like a, um, an ace wrap sort of thing for his ankle, he gave it to me. I took some Advil, um, went back into the ticket office, bought the lift ticket. Uh, it's still a 14 kilometer hike from there to the summit, hiked 14 kilometers. On a, on a really bad ankle, iced it at the top in some snow, and it, um, my entire ankle, as you can see, this one swelled up dramatically. You can't see my ankle bone in that photo. This is probably the next day. The entire foot turned black and blue completely all the way down to the tips of toes, and it took about two months for my ankle to return to its normal size. Um, and we're getting to the last one, last one here, and then we'll get into questions and things, but, um, we, I headed to Vincent Massif in uh, 2010, and it was over the Christmas kind of New Year holiday, so t January 2011, uh, December 2010. This was gonna be the last of the seven summits. And it was a smooth climb, um, beautiful climbing. It's very much like a, a big Rainier, I would describe it. Just way more remote and therefore way more expensive <laughs> to get to. And here's our team topping out on the one section of fixed lines that they put in, which is on like a 40 degree head wall, just to speed up and improve the safety of the climbing. Uh, and we, we summited and had a great time here. In red here is Sally Jewell, who is a you know, local Seattle celebrity as the former CEO of REI, and then shortly thereafter became the Secretary of Interior reporting to Obama. Um, so overall, like great team, great conditions. We get back to, um, the Vincent, or Vincent base camp, and then you fly on a small plane, the Basler here, DC-3, or a twin otter in the background, and arrive to the Union Glacier camp to return our, our big jet flight out. And we had like two or three days before that would happen. And then we had Groundhog Day. And every day after that, for the next two weeks, the operations manager would come into the, the big tent here, dark tent, which is the mess tent. We were camped out in our own little mountaineering tents with our tent mates. Uh, outside and would say, I have good news and bad news. The good news is the weather's gonna be nice today. The bad news is, is there won't be a flight home. And uh, that went on for two weeks. And it was due to a strikes, civil unrest in Chile that shut down the airport. They broke an aircraft when they tried to fly it, then bad weather. And it was very interesting to see the three distinct crowds emerge, I would say. Those that complained and got angry and said, I need to be home, you know, don't you know how busy I am and who I am and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of type A people who do the seven summits um, or who wanna to go to the South Pole. This is, this is the kind of the tourist fly through route for all destinations. Um, the second group that just kind of hung out and just sat inside that cook tent and you know, ate red, those kind of things. And the third, third group who seized the opportunity. I mean, you're in Antarctica. How often are you gonna be in Antarctica? And this was the first year that this camp had been in this location uh, in Union Glacier. Previously, it was on Patriot Hills. This is Mount Rossman here. I ended up climbing this mountain uh, multiple different ways and establishing four first ascents on the mountain. And uh, I, I even read about them later in the American Alpine Journal that someone had submitted on my behalf. And that was pretty neat. One route was the entire ridgeline traverse of the entire mountain. Um, another one was you know, just different various couloirs here. And so here's a photo of me climbing one of the couars. Um, we learned to make an igloo in these down days. We had scientists lecturing us about climate change and the research they were doing in Antarctica. And we also got to play some beach volleyball uh, with an Olympic gold medalist, Greg Vernovich, who's a guide um, previously, at least working for IMG at the time. And, and that's where I'm gonna end this, is uh, playing beach volleyball in Antarctica. And how unusual, that, an experience that can be with, with not only just anybody, but with an Olympic gold medalist. 
And so I would just say, um, you know, I'm sharing my, my info up there if you want to get in touch or if you want to watch a video, but kind of four big things that I would share as I've told through different stories here. Number one is, you know, be bold and dream big. It, this is something that's been done. Um, it wasn't done by me previously. And so this was my big dream to go take this on and break it down into the steps to get there and do it in a responsible way. Number two is, is not underestimating those easy ones. And uh, there's, there's plenty of things that can go wrong. Number three is that you, there are plenty of things that can go wrong and that won't go according to your plan. And sometimes you just gotta roll with that. Um, a lot of things are not under your control when you're climbing, uh, whether that's international logistics and visas and permits, or it's the weather uh, or the snow conditions. And then uh, lastly, it's always bring your positive mental attitude so that when you get those lemons, like getting stuck in Antarctica like this, you can turn it into lemonade. So with that, I will uh, look to turn it over to Garrett here and we can do some Q&A from people. Hey, thanks, Vic. That was awesome. Thank you for sharing and I hope everyone enjoyed that. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or even if you're feeling adventurous and want to turn your video on, I can call on you when uh, you have your video on for a little bit. Uh, the first question, uh, I, I agree, Katie, Holly, yeah, where are the penguins in uh, and, and any of those pictures? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, so the Vincent Massif is located in the um, the Transantarctic Mountains here, and it's quite a bit inland. So the penguins are coastal creatures. So that's one of the disappointing parts is that on the continent itself, you won't see penguins when you fly in because you're flying in so deep. You can have the opportunity to see those in Punta Arenas, Chile. You can see the fairy penguins at a, at a preserve there. Uh, got it. Uh, Carl's asking, which outfitters did you use on Everest and Vincent? Yeah, on... Uh, on Everest and Cho'oyu, I went with Summit Climb. Uh, their website's just summitclimb.com. They are the, one of the more basic um, packages. So it's, it's good for somebody who, it's important to know the difference between what you're buying. So it's not, it's a little bit like when you're saying, what kind of car do you have? Um, you know, you can get a used Toyota or you can get a new Lexus. Um, some of the high-end guiding services are providing that kind of Lexus experience with um, you get your own Western guide for every two or three climbers. You have your own personal Sherpa who helps carry your own personal gear. You get Western food flown in, you know, sushi, whatever. Like you have a big screen, uh, projection screen for movies and base camp and that type of stuff. Um, I didn't have any of that on my expeditions with Summit Climb. It's a very basic type of product. But um, as long as you go in knowing what you're getting and that's what you want, that's, it's, it worked out very well for me. Um, on Vincent, I actually looked at going independent, just like I did on uh, Denali and Aconcagua, but the challenge there is that from our permitting reasons, uh, Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions, ALE, who controls all of the tourist traffic to this area via permit from the National Science Foundation and controls kind of all traffic into Antarctica, basically, uh, they don't want to lose their permit by having, you know, unprepared climbers have to go, go down and get rescued. And it's so remote and so expensive to fly that jet in. Everyone needs to have, you know, a quarter million dollars of rescue insurance, which sounds like a lot, but it, is, it doesn't cost you that much to have the insurance to go get it. Um, the, so they essentially don't want to let independent trips go. And so I ended up signing up with Alpine Ascents International, uh, which is the same group that I did my very first six-day mountaineering course with. They're based here in Seattle as well. All of the trips that run there are approximately the same cost. And they would, it was all cheaper to go with a guided group than it would have been to go independent with my friends anyway at the time. Hmm. Uh, so Shannon and Alan kind of have similar questions. Uh, any plans for another climb and what's your next big project? Yeah, my, um, well, since having kids and things like that, I've kind of shifted from doing the, um, the big Himalayan sort of uh, expeditions where you go away for a month or two Nowadays, there are express options for doing Everest climbs using the uh, acclimatization tents and things like that called Epoxico, which you can do at home, which you can cut it down to, I think the record is two weeks for an Everest trip, which would be mind altering, I think. But um, my, more of my adventures are kind of like the slides I put from the very beginning, which is uh, I love going backcountry skiing. I enjoy going ice climbing, um, going rock climbing, things like that. So it's a lot more local kind of long weekend-ish type adventures right now. Do you, do you ever focus on or think about doing things like 
Bulger's 100 or the tallest peaks in each state kind of list? No, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. My latest thing has been uh, inspired by one of my good friends, Gavin Woody, um, and he's an ultra runner, and we climbed Liberty Ridge together. But, um, you know, he, he really got into ultra running, and so I started to get into running. I ran um, the Grand Canyon rim to rim to rim, which is almost 50 miles and like 10 or 12,000 feet. And this year I was kind of hoping that I could work towards a hundred miler or something like that. And then with COVID and everything getting shut down and canceled that I kind of stepped away from that. But um, that's something I would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, Sky's asking, what's your favorite snack for climbing? Anything you recommend when you don't feel like eating? Oh yeah, that's a good one. So on Everest, people would be like, oh, what was your summit meal you had before you went to the summit? And what food did you pack on summit day and stuff? And I learned that uh, it's not going to be freeze dried, you know, mountain house or anything like that. It's not going to be even ramen noodles. Um, as you get to higher elevations, you really want simple carbs and sugars. That's what your body craves. And no, you can't choke down goose for like 40 days on an expedition. So my staple when I got higher was um, Sour Patch Kids. And because they're small, they come in little bites. You could kind of just pop them in your mouth or sour gummy worms would be a good one. And uh, Pringles is another one because they come in a tube so they don't get crushed in your pack. And uh, you could get those in Namchi or any of the other towns on the approach. And so you could, you could stock up on a, a few canisters of those and then kind of keep them, take them up on the mountain with you. It was on the uh, section of the PCT this weekend. I saw a hiker, a PCT hiker with a Pringle scan sticking out of their backpack too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Connor's wondering, thoughts on desire to climb K2? Yeah, go hang out more with Steve Swenson. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do go ice climbing with Steve. He's the one who taught me how to ice climb. Um, so I've done that for five years, and that's, a, that's amazing. And he's an amazing guy and great to be involved with the Mountaineers. We're so thankful. Um, I, you know, K2 is intellectually interesting, and it's a challenge. And so uh, it's kind of like you just get drawn to a challenge. Uh, Garrett Madison is a good friend of mine and was my guide on Vincent actually without, when he was with Alpine Ascents before he created his own company and when he went off and guided K2 for the first time, um, I forget what year that was, like 2014 or something, uh, and was successful and everything was like a breeze, you know, in terms of perfect weather, perfect snow for their whole trip and I was like, man, I really wish I had <laughs> gone on that trip, but you know, it's a... Um, Climbing high altitude is a really dangerous activity, and so it's it's not one that I would go into lightly at this at this phase in my life with family and kids and things like that. Um, I think the success rate on Everest when I looked for the years prior to when I went for those eight years when I was doing that little analysis was like 38% success on average. So I was lucky that I made it the first time on all of these, which makes it much more efficient from your time and from your money perspective. But um, the death rate is still like one to 2% and so of people who attempt, well, very often you hear about the summit to death ratio, which would be different, but the, the summit uh, attempts to deaths. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a really hard thing to think through. Uh, Karen's uh, similar to Sky, but uh, wondering more of your favorite meals during a high altitude, things you brought along. Because you, you mentioned stay away from sport foods. Yeah. Like, what did you bring along? Um, let's see. Yeah, I think on Denali, I was, it was my first trip on one of these big mountains like that. And I made so many mistakes in terms of food to bring. I remember bringing these like power bars and power bar bites. And like power bars freeze, right? And they were like, wah, 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 wah. you put it in your mouth trying to break off a piece. Um, I was lucky I didn't break any teeth. So definitely not that consistency type of food. I think it, you know, it, I'm trying to remember now from any other expedition, was there anything particular? I mean, the sour gummies and the, and the Pringles were the two big ones from those expeditions. Typically we just did kind of, um, oh, we really like, like some of the more spicy, like pad thai, and um, sp Thai spicy peanut sauce and things like that because maybe it's at al altitude like your taste just kind of gets bland so it's kind of nice to have it spice up but you gotta know what that's going to do to your body one of my teammates did not tolerate so well, tolerate it so well and I remember him diving out of the temp tent at Denali and not even taking the toilet paper and heading to the bathroom and and uh, us saying don't you want the toilet paper he said no time no time you know and so yeah you gotta, gotta know what's going to work for you that's great 
Uh, were there, when you're coming off the mountain, was there a particular food you were looking forward to? Oh yeah, for sure. We, coming off of Denali, I remember um, flying off, ditching our stuff at the bunkhouse for the air taxi service and then going to the West Rib pub and getting these like um, half pound burgers with fries and a pitcher of beer. And then my teammate Justin for dessert ordered a half pound burger. And uh, we ordered had chocolate cake and everything. Um, and he had a half pound burger. And I remember the waitress thought he was kidding at first, but uh, yeah, certainly the meal after is, is a great thing to have. On Everest, I think they tip, I think they made chocolate cake for us when we came down after somebody and successfully and we're off the mountain because they, they would get the radio call ahead that we were in camp to um, waiting to, for the right time of day to go through the ice fall after summiting. Um, so we wait for the next day to come down. Hmm. Karen is uh, wondering, you mentioned uh, earlier about getting certified as a, a wilderness first responder. Do you have any yeah. good stories or maybe, you know, like how you've used it? Once? Yeah, a bunch of different ones. Uh, you know, one was the Everest one, which I mentioned briefly about reviving this person with um, IM dexamethasone. Uh, from they had some cerebral edema, but one that's close to home here. I was climbing Rainier, leading a, a group of eight people up, uh, two rope teams, and my team shouted back to me. I was in the back of the, the long chain of rope for this last bit, and as we were just getting towards the crater, like coming onto the crater, and uh, someone says, "Hey, Vic, we're going to need your medical expertise here in a minute," and I was like, "We're walking up a hill. Like it's very gentle. Like what could possibly have happened?" And I said is it someone on our team or is it something else? And they said, oh, it's someone else. And I was like, well, okay, that, that's good to know at least. And I got up there and there was an individual who had, you know, his chief complaint was a hurt ankle um, inside their boot and everything with crampons sitting on the summit crater. And they, um, you know, I talked to them about it. We went and gave a physical exam and everything and talked about the injury. And it turns out he had dislocated and broken his ankle by just stepping wrong um, with crampons on and was with, he was the experienced climber, was with two kind of beginnerish people. They had come from the other, we had come up the, um, the Emmons side, I think, and they were coming up the DC side. So I couldn't even been helped bring their two people down. Uh, luckily I had my inReach, um, you know, to call for help. And so we, cause he couldn't bear any weight on it at all. And so we, we I relocated it, um, taped it up, uh, put the boot back on, and, uh, and initiated a, a rescue. And thankfully with, with calm weather and, and clear skies, within about um, three hours, we had a helicopter to him and where they were able to extract him off the summit. And I just, uh, given the time and other things in my team of responsibilities, ended up giving him my inReach um, so that he could stay in contact with the Rangers as they came in and ended up taking my team out uh, and back down the mountain then to make sure my team was still gonna be safe. And uh, he knew people who I knew, so he was able to kind of get it back to me uh, a couple of days later. So that, that all worked out well. But yeah, I've had a couple of uh, different situations like that using the, the worker training. Mm -hmm. So highly recommend it to anybody. And uh, keeping it current then too is really important. So every two to three years, getting a recert. Um, it's a three-day recert if you do that, but it's a 10-day it's a course the first time around. So. Mm -hmm. There's more hybrid ones happening with virtually exactly. and then scenarios. And it definitely, as a woofer myself, it changed the way I look at risk and the way I look at uh, just what's going on around me and what could happen and how you would actually fix that problem. It's like that. Uh, so uh, from Brittany, uh, do you keep a constant level of fitness through the seven summit years or train specifically for each mountain? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say there's a general level of fitness through the course of it, but it certainly had peaks. So when I was heading to Cho'oyu, uh, or once I started contemplating that, I ramped up my training significantly. Um, I was, throughout all of these, I was working full-time in management consulting, so I was working, you know, 12 plus hour days, a lot of days, so some weekends. I'd be traveling Monday through Thursday to a client site, or I'd be in Australia for three months at a time, or in China for three months at a time. So it wasn't like I just was here in the Cascades and, you know, was had the summers off or something like that for a seasonal job, um, which makes training kind of hard. 
but um, I, I do live in a condo in downtown Seattle. We have a gym in my condo building. So I, I thoroughly wore out the Stairmaster in the gym. Uh, I would go in every morning with a backpack and drop some dumbbells in the backpack. So I'd have some weights, I'd put some ankle weights on and then I would watch a movie or, you know, TV show while I would, while I would hit the Stairmaster hard and in, in kind of interval training. And then I, in the weekends, I do these kind of like longer, slower burns if I wasn't able to get outside in the hills. So it, it definitely went with peaks. And then once I was at Cho'oyu and did that, and then I was like going to sign up for Everest pretty quickly after coming home, I just kind of even amped up the training more because, um, you know, I certainly didn't want to be the reason that I failed or, or didn't have an enjoyable experience because there's a difference between like, uh, there's a bar for success, then there's a bar for enjoyment. Um, that is much higher. And I've certainly experienced this. I've done Rainier 15 times and I've had some where I hadn't exercised almost at all. I'd been based in London for like two months for a work project, flew home the next day, went and climbed Rainier with some friends. And I remember just being like, Ugh, this is hard. <laughs> um, versus other days, I kept coming back from Everest and did Rainier. And uh, we summited and we're back down at high camp um, after like I think we were back by like seven in the morning or something, you know, it was like ridiculous. We just cut all the switchbacks and passed everybody because we were both acclimated to 20,000 plus feet. Um, so it didn't feel like anything walking up. So. Mm. Uh, and then Alan, is there anything you would have done differently on your journey to the seven summits? Ooh. Well, the biggest, um, one of the biggest challenges is probably around, you know, the group of people that you go to do it with. And that's part of the fun is spending the time with these guys who I got to know really well. It's also very challenging to find a group of people like that who um, have the interest, have the fitness, have the skills, um, can get the time off work and can afford to go. It's kind of like five things that all need to happen and need to stay that way for approximately the, the seven or so years that it took to do this journey. And so my teammates went to uh, Vincent Massif just this last year, actually. So they took a long break between uh, Elbrus and uh, the others. And they have not done a Cho'oyu as a prep for Everest. Uh, it might be a few more years before they do. And a, a number of them have a number of children now. And so now they're in that different phase. And so like, I, I might be interested in wanting to go back with them. But um, it's, that's, again, back to that risk thing with family and stuff. So. It would have been nice to finish all of them with those with those guys. Uh, how did it? I have a question. Uh, how did it feel to finish that last peak? Was it a relief or like? Yeah, it, I I actually started crying. Um, there were two points in my mountaineering summiting that I cried. Um, one was when I came back to camp two on Everest after summiting. And I called my family on the sat phone to say that I, would, I had summited and that I was back in camp too. And I, and I called them again from like base camp because the, the ice fall is still dangerous. But mm -hmm. um, as, as I said, the words like that I had just summited, that's when it started to like really sink in that I had done it. And I, and I kind of cried a little bit. My voice, voice I recall wavering. Um, on Vincent, I remember coming back down from the summit, taking a snack break and just kind of like little tears of joy coming down my face because it had been a project that I had worked on for so long. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's plenty of people who've done it and like, I shouldn't say plenty, there's like only 400 people or so nowadays who've done it maybe in total, but of that, there's a few who've done it in like less than a year or something like that. And so it's not like I was trying to set some speed record for it, but um, the, the style with which I did it in is one of the things that I was proud of and that I was able to largely do these you know, either on my own or with a group of friends, was able to never need assistance from an outside group, you know, to like save me or my teammates, was able to keep the mountain clean in the style that was, you know, deemed the, the best at the time for going out in the mountains. And uh, so that, that's what I feel really good about and what led to those feelings, I think. That's great. Uh, all right, last call if anyone has any other questions for coming up on 820 here. Anyone else? Three, two, one. Uh, all right. Well, I just want to remind uh, the people that are still here. Uh, we uh, did record this, and we'll send it uh, out once it, we get it uploaded onto YouTube. 
uh, it'll be there with the password for a little while and then uh, we'll release about the password. But in the email I'll send out, we'll have the password. So if you need to reference anything uh, from this talk, it'll be there for you tomorrow. Thank you all and hope to see you uh, at Conrad or Mountain Film or Link SAR. And one last thing nobody asked, I, I feel a little bad about this, but I want to let you know, maybe you're wondering if Conrad was uh, joining us. Sorry, I'm running two computers and I was playing a little bit of a joke. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask that at the very beginning to say, is Conrad Anchor joining to hear me talk about the Southern Summits? Amazing. <laughs> Couldn't leave that one up in there. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Vic. Thank Have a good night.